Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in today to another World Audiobooks. We're continuing on with the story of Tarzan. If you guys are enjoying this book so far, would you maybe consider leaving a rating on iTunes? I don't ask very much anymore because it didn't seem to do anything, but it seems like we've got a lot of new listeners recently. Uh, the numbers are kind of spiking up, so super excited about that. If you like the podcast, would you leave a rating and review on iTunes and maybe share the podcast with somebody that you know? It helps so much spread the word. And like I said, I really want to bring you guys more content, but I can only do that if I'm getting uh, some support from you guys. So just remember that every little bit helps, and you just spreading the word about the podcast means more to me than I could ever tell you. So now, without further ado, let's get back into Tarzan. Chapter 5. The White Ape Tenderly, Kayla nursed her little waif, wondering silently why it did not gain strength and agility, as did the other little apes of other mothers. It was nearly a year from the time that the little fellow came into her possession, before he could walk alone, and as for climbing, my, but how stupid he was. Kayla sometimes talked with the older females about her young hopeful, but none of them could understand how a child could be so slow and backward in learning to care for itself. Why, it could not even find food alone, and more than twelve months had passed since Kayla had come upon it. Had they known that the child had seen thirteen moons before it had come into Kayla's possession, they would have considered its case as absolutely hopeless, for the little apes of their own tribe were as far advanced in two or three moons as was this little stranger after twenty-five. Tublot, Kayla's husband, was sorely vexed, and but for the female's careful watching would have put the child out of the way. "'He will never be a great ape,' he argued. "'Always will you have to carry him and protect him.' What good will he be to the tribe? None. Only a burden. Let us leave him quietly sleeping among the tall grasses, that you may bear other and stronger apes to guard us in our old age. Never, Broken Nose, replied Kayla. If I must carry him forever, so be it. And then Two Blood went to Kerchak to urge him to use his authority with Kayla, and force her to give up little Tarzan, which was the name they had given to the tiny Lord Greystoke, which meant White Skin. But when Kerchak spoke to her about it, Kayla threatened to run away from the tribe if they did not leave her in peace with the child, and as this is one of the inalienable rights of the jungle folk, if they be dissatisfied among their own people, they bothered her no more, for Kayla was a fine, clean-limbed young female, and they did not wish to lose her. As Tarzan grew, he made more rapid strides, so that by the time he was ten years old, he was an excellent climber, and on the ground could do many wonderful things which were beyond the powers of his little brothers and sisters. In many ways, he did differ from them, and they often marveled at his superior cunning, but in strength and size he was deficient, for at ten the great anthropoids were fully grown, some of them towering over six feet in height, while little Tarzan was but a half-grown boy. Yet such a boy! From early childhood he had used his hands to swing from branch to branch after the manner of his giant mother, and as he grew older he spent hour upon hour daily speeding through the treetops with his brothers and sisters. He could spring twenty feet across space at the dizzy heights of the forest top, and grasp with unerring precision and without apparent jar a limb waving wildly in the path of an approaching tornado. He could drop twenty feet at a stretch from limb to limb in rapid descent to the ground, or he could gain the utmost pinnacle of the loftiest tropical giant with the ease and swiftness of a squirrel. Though but ten years old, he was fully as strong as the average man of thirty, and far more agile than the most practiced athlete ever becomes, and day by day his strength was increasing. His life among these fierce apes had been happy, for his recollection held no other life, nor did he know that there existed within the universe aught else than his little forest and the wild jungle animals with which he was familiar. He was nearly ten before he commenced to realize that a great difference existed between himself and his fellows. His little body, burned brown by exposure, suddenly caused him feelings of intense shame, for he realized that it was entirely hairless, like some low snake or other reptile. He attempted to obviate this by plastering himself from head to foot with mud, but this dried and fell off. Besides, it felt so uncomfortable that he quickly decided that he preferred the shame to the discomfort. In the higher land which his tribe frequented was a little lake, and it was here that Tarzan first saw his face in the clear, still water of its bosom. It was a sultry day of the dry season that he and one of his cousins had gone down to the bank to drink. As they leaned over, both little faces were mirrored on the placid pool, and fierce and terrible features of the ape 
beside those of the aristocratic scion of an old English house. Tarzan was appalled. It had been bad enough to be hairless, but to own such a countenance. He wondered that the other apes could look at him at all. That tiny slit of a mouth, those puny white teeth, how they looked beside the mighty lips and powerful fangs of his more fortunate brothers. And the little pinched nose of his, so thin was it that it looked half-starved. He turned red as he compared it with the beautiful broad nostrils of his companion. Such a gorgeous nose, why it spread half across his face. It certainly must be fine to be so handsome, thought poor little Tarzan. But when he saw his own eyes, ah, oh, that was the final blow. A brown spot, a grey circle, and then blank whiteness. Frightful! Not even the snakes had such hideous eyes as he. So intent was he upon this personal appraisement of his features that he did not hear the parting of the tall grass behind him as a great body pushed itself stealthily through the jungle. Nor did his companion, the ape, hear either, for he was drinking, and the noise of his sucking lips and gurgles of satisfaction drowned the quiet approach of the intruder. Thirty paces beyond the two she crouched, Sabor, the huge lioness, lashing her tail. Cautiously she moved a great padded paw forward, noiselessly placing it before she lifted the next. Thus she advanced, her belly low, almost touching the surface of the ground, a great cat preparing to spring upon its prey. Now she was within ten feet of the two unsuspecting little playfellows. Carefully she drew her hind feet well up beneath her body, and the great muscles rolling under the beautiful skin. So low she was crouching now that she seemed flattened to the earth, except for the upward bend of the glossy back as it gathered for the spring. No longer the tail lashed, quiet and straight behind her it lay. An instant she paused thus, as though turned to stone, and then, with an awful scream, she sprang. Sabor, the lioness, was a wise hunter. To one less wise, the wild alarm of her fierce cry as she sprang would have seemed a foolish thing, for could she not more surely have fallen upon her victims, had she but quietly leaped without that loud shriek? But Sabor knew well the wondrous quickness of the jungle folk, and their almost unbelievable powers of hearing. To them, the sudden scraping of one blade of grass across another was as effectual a warning as her loudest cry, and Sabor knew that she could not make that mighty leap without a little noise. Her wild scream was not a warning. It was voiced to freeze her poor victims in a paralysis of terror, for the tiny fraction of an instant which would suffice for her mighty claws to sink into their soft flesh and hold them beyond hope of escape. So far as the ape was concerned, Sabor reasoned correctly. The little fellow crouched trembling just an instant, but that instant was quite long enough to prove his undoing. Not so, however, with Tarzan, the man-child. His life amidst the dangers of the jungle had taught him to meet emergencies with self-confidence, and his higher intelligence resulted in a quickness of mental action far beyond the powers of the apes. So the scream of Sabor, the lioness, galvanized the brain and muscles of little Tarzan into instant action. Before him lay the deep waters of the little lake, behind him certain death, a cruel death beneath tearing claws and rending fangs. Tarzan had always hated water except as a medium for quenching his thirst. He hated it because he connected it with the chill and discomfort of the torrential rains, and he feared it for the thunder and lightning and wind which accompanied them. The deep waters of the lake he had been taught by his wild mother to avoid, and further, had he not seen little Nita sink beneath its quiet surface only a few short weeks before, never to return to the tribe? But of those two evils, his quick mind chose the lesser, ere the first note of Sabor's scream had scarce broke the quiet of the jungle, and before the great beast had covered half a leap, Tarzan felt the chill water close above his head. He could not swim, and the water was very deep, but still he lost no particle of that self-confidence and resourcefulness which were the badges of his superior being. Rapidly he moved his hands and feet in an attempt to scramble upward, and, possibly, more by chance than design, he fell into the stroke that a dog uses when swimming, so that, within a few seconds, his nose was above the water, and he found that he could keep it there by continuing his strokes, and also make progress through the water. He was much surprised and pleased with his new acquirements, which had been so suddenly thrust upon him, but he had no time for thinking much upon it. He was now swimming parallel to the bank, and there he saw the cruel beast that would have seized him, crouching upon the still form of his little playmate. The lioness was intently watching Tarzan, evidently expecting him to return to shore, but this the boy had no intention of doing. Instead, he raised his voice in the call of distress common to his tribe, adding to it the warning which would prevent would-be rescuers from running into the clutches of Sabor. 
Almost immediately, there came an answer from the distance, and presently forty or fifty great apes swung rapidly and majestically through the trees toward the scene of tragedy. In the lead was Kayla, for she had recognized the tones of her best beloved, and with her was the mother of the little ape who lay dead beneath cruel Sabor. Though more powerful and better equipped for fighting than the apes, the lioness had no desire to meet these enraged adults, and with a snarl of hatred she sprang quickly into the brush and disappeared. Tarzan now swam to shore and clambered quickly upon dry land. The feeling of freshness and exhilaration which the cool waters had imparted to him filled his little being with grateful surprise, and ever after he lost no opportunity to take a daily plunge in lake or stream or ocean when it was possible to do so. For a long time, Kayla could not accustom herself to the sight, for though her people could swim when forced to it, they did not like to enter the water, and never did so voluntarily. The adventure with the lioness gave Tarzan food for pleasurable memories, for it was such affairs which broke the monotony of his daily life, otherwise but a dull round of searching for food, eating, and sleeping. The tribe to which he belonged roamed a tract extending roughly twenty-five miles along the sea coast, and some fifty miles inland. This they traversed almost continually, and occasionally remaining for months in one locality. But as they moved through the trees with great speed, they often covered the territory in a very few days. Much depended upon food supply, climatic conditions, and the prevalence of animals of the more dangerous species. Though Kershak often led them on long marches for no other reason than that he had tired of remaining in the same place. At night they slept where darkness overtook them, lying upon the ground, and sometimes covering their heads, and more seldom their bodies, with the great leaves of the elephant's ear. Two or three might lie cuddled in each other's arms for additional warmth if the night were chill, and thus Tarzan had slept in Kayla's arms nightly for all these years. That the huge, fierce brute loved this child of another race is beyond question, and he too gave to the great hairy beast all the affection that would have belonged to his fair young mother had she lived. When he was disobedient, she cuffed him, it is true, but she was never cruel to him, and was more often caressing him than chastising him. Tublat, her mate, always hated Tarzan, and on several occasions had come near ending his youthful career. Tarzan, on his part, never lost an opportunity to show that he fully reciprocated his foster father's sentiments, and whenever he could safely annoy him, or make faces at him, or hurl insults upon him from the safety of his mother's arms, or the slender branches of the higher trees, he did so. His superior intelligence and cunning permitted him to invent a thousand diabolical tricks to add to the burdens of Tublat's life. Early in his boyhood, he had learned to form ropes by twisting and tying long grasses together, and with these, he was forever tripping Tublat or attempting to hang him from some overhanging branch. By constant playing and experimenting with ease, he learned to tie rude knots and make sliding nooses, and with these, he and the younger apes amused themselves. When Tarzan did, they tried to do also, but he alone originated and became proficient. One day, while playing thus, Tarzan had thrown his rope at one of his fleeing companions, retaining the other end in his grasp. By accident, the noose fell squarely about the running ape's neck, bringing him to a sudden and surprising halt. Ah, here was a new game, a fine game, thought Tarzan, and immediately he attempted to repeat the trick, and thus, by painstaking and continued practice, he learned the art of roping. Now indeed was the life of Tublat a living nightmare. In sleep, upon the march, night or day, he never knew when that quiet noose would slip around his neck and nearly choke the life out of him. Kayla punished. Tublat swore dire vengeance, and old Kerchak took notice, and warned and threatened, but all to no avail. Tarzan defied them all, and the thin, strong noose continued to settle about Tublat's neck whenever he least expected it. The other apes derived unlimited amusement from Tublat's discomfiture, for Broken Nose was a disagreeable old fellow, whom no one liked anyway. In Tarzan's clever little mind, many thoughts revolved, and back of these was his divine power of reason. If he could catch his fellow apes with his long arm of many grasses, why not Sabor the lioness? It was the germ of a thought which, however, was destined to mull around in his conscious and subconscious mind until it resulted in magnificent achievement. But that came in later years. Chapter 6 Jungle Battles The wanderings of the tribe brought them often near the closed and silent cabin of the little landlocked harbour. To Tarzan, this was always a source of never-ending mystery and pleasure. 
He would peek into the curtain windows, or, climbing upon the roof, peer down the black depths of the chimney in vain endeavour to solve the unknown wonders that lay within those strong walls. His childlike imagination pictured wonderful creatures within, and the very impossibility of forcing entrance added a thousandfold to his desire to do so. He could clamber about the roof and windows for hours, attempting to discover means of ingress, but to the door he paid little attention, for this was apparently as solid as the walls. It was in the next visit to the vicinity, following the adventure with old Sabor, that, as he approached the cabin, Tarzan noticed that from a distance the door appeared to be an independent part of the wall in which it was set, and for the first time it occurred to him that this might prove the means of entrance which had so long eluded him. He was alone, as was often the case when he visited the cabin, for the apes had no love for it. The story of the thunderstick, having lost nothing in the telling during these ten years, had quite surrounded the white man's deserted abode with an atmosphere of weirdness and terror for the simians. The story of his own connection with the cabin had never been told him. The language of the apes had so few words that they could talk but little of what they had seen in the cabin, having no words to accurately describe either the strange people or their belongings. And so, long before Tarzan was old enough to understand, the subject had been forgotten by the tribe. Only in a dim, vague way did Kayla explain to him that his father had been a strange white ape, but he did not know that Kayla was not his own mother. On this day, then, he went directly to the door, and spent hours examining it and fussing with the hinges, the knob, and the latch. Finally, he stumbled upon the right combination, and the door swung creakily open before his astonished eyes. For some minutes he did not dare venture within— but finally, as his eyes became accustomed to the dim light of the interior, he slowly and cautiously entered. In the middle of the floor lay a skeleton, every vestige of flesh gone from the bones to which still clung the mildewed and moulded remnants of what had once been clothing. Upon the bed lay a similar gruesome thing, but smaller, while in a tiny cradle nearby was a third, a wee mite of a skeleton. To none of these evidences of a fearful tragedy of a long dead day did little Tarzan give but passing heed. His wild jungle life had inured him to the sight of dead and dying animals, and had he known that he was looking upon the remains of his own father and mother, he would have been no more greatly moved. The furnishings, now the contents of the room it was, which riveted his attention. He examined many things minutely, strange tools and weapons, books, paper, clothing— what little had withstood the ravages of time in the humid atmosphere of the jungle coast. He opened chests and cupboards, such as did not baffle his small experience, and in these he found the contents much better preserved. Among other things, he found a sharp hunting knife, on the keen blade of which he immediately proceeded to cut his finger. Undaunted, he continued his experiments, finding that he could hack and hew splinters of wood from the table and chairs with his new toy. For a long time this amused him, but, finally tiring, he continued his explorations. In a cupboard, filled with books, he came across one with brightly colored pictures. It was a child's illustrated alphabet. A is for Archer, who shoots the bow. B is for Boy. His first name is Joe. The pictures interested him greatly. There were many apes with faces similar to his own, and further over in the book he found, under M, some little monkeys, such as he saw daily flitting through the trees of his primeval forest. But nowhere was pictured any of his own people, in all the book was none that resembled Kerchak, or Tublat, or Kayla. At first he tried to pick the little figures from the leaves, but he soon saw that they were not real, though he knew not what they might be, nor had he any words to describe them. The boats and trains and cows and horses were quite meaningless to him, but not quite so baffling as the odd little figures which appeared beneath and between the coloured pictures. Some strange kind of bug he thought they might be, for many of them had legs, though nowhere could he find one with eyes and a mouth. It was his first introduction to the letters of the alphabet, and he was over ten years old. Of course, he had never before seen print, or ever had spoken with any living thing which had the remotest idea that such a thing as a written language existed, nor ever had he seen anyone reading. So what wonder that the little boy was quite at a loss to guess the meaning of these strange figures. Near the middle of the book, he found his old enemy, Sabor, the lioness, and further on, coiled Hista, the snake. Oh, it was most engrossing. Never before, in all his ten years, had he enjoyed anything so much. So absorbed was he that he did not note the approaching dusk until it was quite upon him and the figures were blurred. He put the book back in the cupboard and closed the door, for he did not wish anyone else to find and destroy his treasure, 
and as he went out into the gathering darkness, he closed the great door of the cabin behind him, as it had been before he discovered the secret of its lock. But before he left, he had noticed a hunting knife lying where he had thrown it upon the floor, and this he picked up and took with him to show his fellows. He had taken scarce a dozen steps toward the jungle, when a great form rose up before him from the shadows of a low bush. At first he thought it was one of his own people, but in another instant he realized that it was Bolgani, the huge gorilla. So close was he that there was no chance for flight, and little Tarzan knew that he must stand and fight for his life, for these great beasts were the deadly enemies of his tribe, and neither one nor the other ever asked or gave quarter. Had Tarzan been a full-grown bull ape of the species of his tribe, he would have been more than a match for the gorilla, but being only a little English boy, though enormously muscular for such, he stood no chance against his cruel antagonist. In his veins, though, flowed the blood of the best of a race of mighty fighters, and back of this was the training of his short lifetime among the fierce brutes of the jungle. He knew no fear, as we know it. His little heart beat the faster, but from the excitement and exhilaration of adventure. Had the opportunity presented itself, he would have escaped, but solely because his judgment told him he was no match for the great thing which confronted him, and since reason showed him that successful flight was impossible, he met the gorilla squarely and bravely, without a tremor of a single muscle or any sign of panic. In fact, he met the brute midway in its charge, striking its huge body with his close fists and as futilely as he had been a fly attacking an elephant. But in one hand, he still clutched a knife he had found in the cabin of his father, and as the brute, striking and biting, closed upon him, the boy accidentally turned the point toward the hairy beast. As the knife sank deep into his body, the gorilla shrieked in pain and rage. But the boy had learned in that brief second a use for his sharp and shining toy, so that, as the tearing, striking beast dragged him to earth, he plunged the blade repeatedly and to the hilt into his breast. The gorilla, fighting after the manner of its kind, struck terrific blows with its open hand and tore the flesh of the boy's throat and chest with his mighty tusks. For a moment they rolled upon the ground in a fierce frenzy of combat. More and more weakly the torn and bleeding arm struck home with a long, sharp blade. Then the little fingers stiffened with a spasmodic jerk, and Tarzan, the young Lord Greystoke, rolled unconscious upon the dead and decaying vegetation which carpeted his jungle home. A mile back in the forest, the tribe had heard the fierce challenge of the gorilla, and, as was his custom when any danger threatened, Kerchak called his people together, partly for mutual protection against a common enemy, since this gorilla might be but one of a party of several, and also to see that all the members of the tribe were accounted for. It was soon discovered that Tarzan was missing, and Tublat was strongly opposed to sending assistance. Kerchak himself had no liking for the strange little waif, so he listened to Tublat, and finally, with a shrug of his shoulders, turned back to the pile of leaves on which he had made his bed. But Kayla was of a different mind. In fact, she had not waited but to learn that Tarzan was absent, as she was fairly flying through the matted branches toward the point from which the cries of the gorilla were still plainly audible. Darkness had now fallen, and an early moon was sending its faint light to cast strange, grotesque shadows among the dense foliage of the forest. Here and there the brilliant rays penetrated to earth, but for the most part they only served to accentuate the stygian blackness of the jungle's depths. Like some huge phantom, Kayla swung noiselessly from tree to tree, now running nimbly along the great branch, now swinging through space at the end of another, only to grasp that of a father tree, in a rapid progress toward the scene of the tragedy her knowledge of jungle life told her was being enacted a short distance before her. The cries of the gorilla proclaimed that it was in mortal combat with some other denizen of the fierce wood. Suddenly these cries ceased, and the silence of death reigned throughout the jungle. Kayla could not understand, for the voice of Bulgani had at last been raised in the agony of suffering and death, but no sound had come to her by which she possibly could determine the nature of his antagonist. That her little Tarzan could destroy a great bull gorilla she knew to be improbable, and so, as she neared the spot from which the sounds of the struggle had come, she moved more warily, and at last, slowly, and with extreme caution, she transversed the lowest branches, peering eagerly into the moon-splashed blackness for a sign of the combatants. Presently she came upon them, lying in a little open space, full under the brilliant light of the moon, little Tarzan's torn and bloody form, and beside it a great bull gorilla, stone dead. 
With a low cry, Kayla rushed to Tarzan's side, and gathering the poor, blood-covered body to her breast, listened for a sign of life. Faintly, she heard it, and the weak beating of the little heart. Tenderly, she bore him back through the inky jungle, to where the tribe lay, and for many days and nights she sat guard beside him, bringing him food and water, and brushing the flies and other insects from his cruel wounds. Of medicine or surgery, the poor thing knew nothing. She could but lick the wounds, and thus she kept them cleansed, that healing nature might more quickly do her work. At first, Tarzan would eat nothing, but rolled and tossed in a wild delirium of fever. All he craved was water, and this she brought him in the only way she could, bearing it in her own mouth. No human mother could have shown more unselfish and sacrificing devotion than did this poor wild brute for the little orphan waif whom fate had thrown into her keeping. At last the fever abated, and the boy commenced to mend. No word of complaint passed his tight, set lips, though the pain of his wounds was excruciating. A portion of his chest was laid bare to the ribs, three of which had been broken by the mighty blows of the gorilla. One arm was nearly severed by the giant fangs, and a great piece had been torn from his neck, exposing his jugular vein, which the cruel jaws had missed but by a miracle. With the stoicism of the brutes who had raised him, he endured his sufferings quietly, preferring to crawl away from the others, and lie huddled in some clump of tall grasses, rather than to show his misery before their eyes. Kayla, alone, he was glad to have with him, but now that he was better, she was gone longer at a time in search of food for the devoted animal had scarcely eaten enough to support her own life while Tarzan had been so low, and was, in consequence, reduced to a mere shadow of her former self. Thanks so much for listening today, guys. Hope you enjoyed this little section of the book. we got more coming at you next week. And remember, if you want to go back and listen, we've got all kinds of books on the podcast, or I just updated the YouTube channel and added several full-length uh, YouTube videos there of books that we've done in the past. So you can go there and uh, listen to the full thing, ending included. That's a huge thing I've noticed with YouTube audiobooks. A lot of times they don't include the ending for some odd reason. So I always include the ending because what's a book without the ending? Thanks so much for listening today, and remember to share the podcast with somebody that you know who might enjoy a free audiobook, because good things are meant to be shared. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time.